can't say. The creative team at Nikolai's Plant Adventures would like to acknowledge that we are filming on Treaty 6 territory at a Miskwaskigwaskwagen, also known as the Beaver Hill House. We would like to acknowledge and thank all the indigenous people of Turtle Island. We wouldn't be where we are today without their stewardship of the land and all their unique nations and teachings. I hope to honor my heritage and ancestors by passing down the importance of nature and storytelling through this show. We keep our cultures alive through the stories we tell, and I hope someday to hear yours as well. Miigwech. Hi, hi. It is mid-fall here at the Beaver House, and we just experienced our first snowfall. Most of the trees are pretty bare. You can see a few tiny buds, but all the leaves have gone. This one still has some leaves. See? Three little leaves. This one still has most of its leaves. I wonder why. I appreciate that it's so colorful. I love all the reds, oranges, and dark browns. There's even a little bit of green. It's very beautiful. I wonder what will happen to all these things under the snow. Like this bark. Or these leaves. Or this big, long piece of grass. You can see the grains at the top. What will happen to all of this? I decide to investigate. There may be snow outside, but there's still so much more to learn about plants. Hi everyone, it's great to see you again. Last adventure, we were looking at mushrooms. We were looking at mushrooms from the grocery store and identifying them, and I even found a couple outside. We also looked at other decomposing plants, like lichen, moss, and mold. Here's a piece of moss here. Look how fuzzy it is. It holds lots of water. We found mold in these yucky pumpkins. Look at that. There's mold in there, but there's also little sprouts. Isn't that neat? Then we made some art using mushrooms. I used fresh and dried mushrooms to make funky patterns. I wonder what you could come up with. At the very end of our adventure, I shared some Mother Goose poems I really love. Mother Goose poems are very old and some have stayed the same for a long time but others have changed. Some have even become brand new stories. It's like a little life cycle, just like looking in that pumpkin. Now let's go on our new adventure. Hi everyone, it's good to see you. I'm just about to head out on a walk. Come and join me. I love going out on walks to look at nature. There's always something new to see. At this time of year, a lot of the trees are bare. They lost all their leaves in the fall. But now there are some trees that stay green all year round. Sometimes people call them evergreen trees, but scientists call them coniferous trees.
There are all kinds of coniferous trees, pine, spruce, cedar. At first glance, they might all look the same. But if you look closer, like we did with the mushrooms, you can see all the parts that makes each coniferous tree unique and special. I decided to go to the river valley to look for trees. I'm very proud of the river valley. It's a very special place in the Miskoskiko Squigan. It is one of the largest urban green centers on Turtle Island. Green spaces are spaces focused on nature, like a park or a forest. Urban means it's in the city. Other cities also have large green spaces like Stanley Park in Vancouver. Having a large green space like the river valley is super important for Edmontonians because it gives us a safe place to play and explore nature right here in the city. I've come to the River Valley many times throughout my life, oftentimes during field trips. There's always more to learn in the River Valley. Before I left home today, I looked up different tree identifying guides online. Governments, universities, and other educational centers will make identification guides to help nature lovers get proper information about local species. It is easy to look for information online, it can be harder to tell if it's correct. That's why it's good to look for information from a trusted source. When you go to identify species, feel free to check multiple sources. Each guide is a little different and might have some species or other information that others don't. First, here are some words you should know before identifying carnivorous trees. Needle. These are the long pokey pieces of the tree. They are like the leaves of the some carnivorous plants. Sheath. This is the bottom part holding two or more needles together. Some trees will have needles with sheaths and some will not. Single, meaning there is only one. Bundle and cluster. Both these words mean group of. When we're talking about carnivorous trees, bundles are used for needles that have sheaths. Clusters are used for groups of needles that have no sheath. Now that we know some of these terms, we can start identifying some trees. I've loved learning more about local wildlife. It has made going outside more fun. Like a giant guessing game. I found this tree, but something looks odd about it. This part has short, single, unsheathed needles. But this part has long, sheathed needles with bundles of two. What is going on? It looks like the branch with the long needles is not attached to the tree. Did it fall? No, it's a separate tree. It's just growing in a weird way. When I break the needles, they give off a strong pine smell. Now that I figure out that mystery, I can identify the trees. I think the main tree might be a white spruce tree because it has single unsheathed needles. Needles without sheaths are called unsheathed. Un is another way of saying not, not sheathed. Noticing if a needle has a sheath or not is an important part of identifying these trees. When I look closer at the shape of the needle, I notice that it's squarish and it feels sharp and stiff. According to the guide, I have a white spruce. I think this other one is a jack pine. Jack pines have long sheathed needles in bundles of two. If we look closer at the shape, it looks quite straight, just like other jack pines. One tricky part about identifying these trees, though, is a lot of the pine cones are missing. Pine cones are an important part to identifying trees. Here I found a unique specimen. This one is likely a cypress. You can tell it's a cypress because it has scale-like leaves. Instead of having needles, like the other carnivorous trees do, this one has scales and it comes off in little pieces. You can see me pick off those pieces while I'm playing around with this dry one.
While identifying carnivorous trees, smelling is a great way to identify different species. Some will have strong scents, like the white pine, while others, like the cypress, do not. Let's take a look at these two similar looking branches. I want to focus on just the needles. Both these needles are sheathed and are bundles of two. But there are some differences to them. One is much longer, the other is short. The longer one is more twisty and the shorter one is straighter. When trying to identify trees, it's also important to look at the bark. The bark of each tree can look very unique. On this tree, you can see these small, soft cones. On trees, you'll also find sap, like hanging off this branch. Look how scaly this branch is. It has all different colors in it. When identifying trees, it's also important to look for pine cones. Unfortunately, I couldn't find many on the tree, only on the ground, so it was hard to identify which cone belonged to which tree. But they still give so many clues about what these trees could be. What should we do now? That was a lot of fun looking at trees. What can I do next? I got it. Nikolai's Beginner Guide to Knitting and Crochet. You will need yarn, optional, a crochet hook or knitting needles. Growing up, I lived with my grandma. This meant I spent a lot of time around crafty old ladies. They taught me how to knit, crochet, cross stitch, and embroider. I haven't practiced knitting in a long time, so I'm not sure how to use the knitting needles, but I do remember how to crochet. At its most basic, crocheting is about pulling loops through other loops in different patterns. Here you can see me crocheting with a crochet hook. I'm doing a stitch called a single crochet. However, you can also do some basic crocheting with your hands. First start off by tying a loop near the end of the string. Make sure it's big enough you can put your pinchy fingers through it. Then grab some yarn and pull it through. Move your fingers so they are inside the loop again and keep going. It makes a very loose weave, but it's a great way to learn how crocheting works. Which reminds me, there's one other style of knitting I can show you, finger knitting. First, wrap your fingers. We are going to do this by going over and under each finger two times. For this style of knitting, it is important that you have two lines of yarn on each of your fingers. Once you have two lines, pick up the bottom one and pull it over the other string and over your finger. Make sure to keep good tension on the yarn. Tension is how tight something is. If the tension is too high, then it'll be really tight. It'll be hard to get your fingers through. But if it's too loose, it might get tangled up or look sloppy.
Once you take all the bottom lines off your fingers, you can rewrap your fingers and start again. Keep going until it is the length that you want for your project. When you are done, tie it off. I made this pair of fingerless gloves by sewing the two panels together. I'd love to see what you come up with. Looking at the coniferous tree and knitting reminds me of a story from my culture. I grew up Ukrainian. In Ukraine, they will decorate their Christmas trees with spider webs because of a story they tell. I was amazed when I heard this story. I love spiders and their beautiful webs. It's nice to have a story that appreciates that. It goes like this. There once was a poor family. They were so poor they had a dirt floor and very little to eat. Coming out of the floor was a little evergreen tree, and inside lived a small family of spiders. One day, the family noticed the tree living on the floor. The spiders inside were scared that the family would remove the tree, but instead they fell in love with it and decided to take care of it. All year long, the human family and the spider family did their best to take care of one another. The humans took care of the tree, and the spiders did their best to capture all the bugs in their home. As Christmas approached, it was very cold. The family struggled to get enough food. Christmas Eve came, and the family had no presents or feast. All they had was some bland soup and bread. The spiders felt so sorry for the family. They were warm in their tree and had food in their bellies. They wanted to get back to this family who had helped them all year, even when they could have kicked them out. During the night, while the family was asleep, the spiders started spinning the web on the tree. They worked all night long. When morning came, the family woke up to see the tree, and they were in awe of its beauty. It was so sparkly, and it glimmered. When they looked at the threads, they noticed it was silver. And a big smile went on their face. Silver? We can finally afford to eat. They were so happy and jumped with joy. The spider family was so happy they could help them out. They all lived happily ever after. The end. As I said, I really love that story. So cute. And we oftentimes think spiders are icky, but they are helpful. Well, I hope you enjoyed the day. Let me know of any other carnivorous trees you find. See you.